Now today we're going to finish up on our teaching on how to avoid tragedy in the life, your life, or in the lives of individuals. It's formerly from our book called Why Tragedy Happens to Christians. Uh, I'd like to relate a story to you that happened a few years ago that's kind of humorous. My nephew was coming down to deer camp when we were deer hunting one night, and he came down there. He got there kind of late, and we said, uh, I asked him, I said, what happened to you? Well, he said, do you know, said I was driving down the road listening to your tapes. And he said, I missed a curve and run off in the ditch. And uh, we talked around there a little bit. And after a while, I asked him, I said, well, what, what tape series were you listening to? He said, why tragedy happens to Christians. <laughs> so he, he uh, even though he was listening to the tapes, he wasn't paying attention to what he was doing. I want us to talk today, we're going to talk about, we've got about three different uh, chapters to cover, so let's get into it. The number nine, chapter number nine, is strife, an open door to Satan. Now there's probably more Christians that fall into this pitfall than any other. And I'll tell you it's quite easy to do because uh, it's easy to get in strife nowadays, <laughs> even by teaching the Word of God. When you're teaching the Word of God, and you got people that are just blaspheming the Word and, and the name of Jesus and everything else. It makes you want to, you know, crack their head open sometimes. But we have to do, as the Apostle Paul says, we must in meekness instruct those that oppose themselves. Now let's read from a passage of Scripture in James, the, the third chapter and sets the stage for what we're going to talk about here because I'm sure that none of you have ever gotten into strife in the last 10 minutes, that is. But let's read from James, the uh, let's see, what is the third chapter in verse 16. Where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Well, I think it would be good if we'd back up a few scriptures here and get some of the context of what he's saying. Let's start with verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. But if ye have bitter and envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now verse 16 for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Now, I don't know if you realize it or not, but James was not just filling in pages in the Bible when he said that. Now, what we need to realize is that God has laid down some rules and some regulations. This is the manufacturer's handbook. This is a book to live by. We can't just go through life and make up our own rules as we go and expect to operate in the wisdom of God. If we're praying for the wisdom of God and we're in envy and strife with someone, the Word says there is confusion in every evil work. So it's not a matter of whether we want to do it or whether we don't want to do it. It's a matter of making a decision to do what the Word says to do. Now, it's not this way just because James said that. Now I want you to listen to what I'm saying. It's not that way just because James said it, but it was that way, that's the reason James said that to you. Because he knew that where there was envy and strife, there would be confusion in every evil work. It invites confusion. It invites the work of the enemy. And if you're going to operate in the wisdom of God and the mind and direction of the Holy Spirit, then we're going to have to stay out of strife and stay away from confusion because that's exactly what it brings. Let's go to John's Gospel, the first chapter, and there's a couple of 
verses here I want us to look at. 1 John, that's 1 John chapter 2, and let's read from verse 10 down through verse 14. He that, well, let's start verse 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, you know, you couldn't get any more plain than that. This is self-explanatory in the fact that when you walk in darkness, you don't see what you're stumbling over. And when we walk with hatred in our heart, when we walk in strife, and walk out of the will of God, not walking in the love of God, then he says you're walking in darkness, and, and these, because darkness has blinded your eyes, and you know very well that if you get up in the nighttime, in your house even, start through the house, at, after dark you're liable to stump your toe on a chair. And I'm sure some of you have done that. The reason was because you couldn't see where you were going. You were operating in darkness. Now that's the reason that many people in life have troubles, problems, catastrophe, calamity, tragedies happen because they walk in darkness. Now, I'm talking about Christians as well. Now, certainly it ought not be so concerning Christians. But you see, it is so. And that's what invites tragedy in the lives of many people. And then because something bad happened in their life, someone always says, well, you know what the Bible says. All things work together for good. Fully. <laughs> Someone said three Chinese cheers for that. Fooey, fooey, fooey. Well, no, all things don't work together for good. That wasn't working together for good because tragedy happened in that individual's life. It could have been because they didn't walk in love, because they knew the Word of God but didn't operate in it, and they opened the door to the devil. They gave the devil foothold in the door. And you know, the Apostle Paul says, give no place to the devil. Well, if Paul took the time and the effort to write and say, don't give any place to the devil, then you must be able to give place to the devil or he wouldn't have said it in the first place. So if we're going to walk in darkness, we're going to stumble. And we're going to have problems. We're going to have troubles in life. So let's make a decision. You see, it, it, it takes a quality decision to do what the Word of God said to do. Now let's come on over to the fifth chapter of, of John and from verse 4. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Now here he tells you that if you're born again, you have the ability in you to overcome the world. Faith in God, faith that comes by the Word of God is capable of making you a world overcomer. You can overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil by operating in the authority of the Word of God. But you see, we've got to make a decision to do what the Word says to do and to walk in the light of what the Word tells us. I think sometimes people think that... Uh, they just make up their own rules as they go, then they'll plead ignorance before God. <laughs> but you see, ignorance is no excuse. We need to know what God says. He's given us his word, and when God gave us his word, then we're responsible for entering into that word and obtaining from the word of God the information, the ability that is in that word to cause the manifestation of the promise. See, God's made provision for us in this life. I think uh, we've misunderstood the scripture over there in Romans, the 12th chapter. In fact, I think we ought to talk about that in just a minute. Where Paul makes this statement that uh, he talks about God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Romans chapter 12. Verse 3 says, For I say, through the grace of God given unto me, 
to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now notice he says God has dealt to every man the measure. Now he's talking about every man among you, of course, those that had uh, f from the Roman church, so they were born again people. But now let's look at this for a minute. He says God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, I've heard it preached, and I, I may have even preached it that way myself in times past, but I, as I studied this, I saw something in this that I hadn't seen. And that is that he has dealt to every man the measure of faith, which does not mean that we have all the faith that there is. Now, I've heard some people say that, and I can understand why they said that, because uh, when we were born again, while well, we did have faith from the Word of God, but here he is saying the measure. Now, what is the measure? Now, first of all, let's ask it this way. How do you measure faith? Do you measure it in quarts? Do you, me do you measure it in pounds? <laughs> do you have a ton of faith? Or do you have a bushel of faith? How can you measure faith? The only way that you can measure faith is to find out how much of the word that an individual has in them. Now here's my reasoning and here's, here's a scripture for it. Paul says concerning the word of God and faith in God, he says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans uh, 10, 17. So God's word is filled with faith. This word is filled with faith. Now if there wasn't any faith in this word, you couldn't get any faith by hearing it. But because the word is filled with faith, then we get faith or gain faith when we confess and speak the Word of God. It gets inside you. So then to measure the amount of faith that's in an individual, you'd have to know how much Word is in that individual. That's the only way you could measure the faith. You can't see faith. You can't measure faith any other way. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. You take an individual that says, Well, yes, I believe that God will save you. If you'll just repent, confess your sins, he'll save you, forgive your sins. But the same fellow may say, but God won't heal anymore because healing went out with the apostles. Well, now, what do you have here? You've got a born-again man here that's living for God. He's on his way to heaven, but he believes in salvation, but he doesn't believe in divine healing. He may not believe in prosperity. He may not believe that God will bless you financially in any manner. Well, what's the problem? The problem is that he has no word in him concerning healing. He doesn't know the healing scriptures. He has not meditated on them. He has not given any time to the scripture concerning healing and meditation to it and prayer concerning that matter. He just simply believed what somebody told him and somebody told him a lie and said that healing went out with the apostles and God doesn't heal anymore. So therefore, Miracles are not for today. So here's a man that has faith. He has great faith in the gospel to get people saved. And he can preach and get them saved. Thank God for that. But then right on the other hand, he has no word in him concerning healing. Has no word in him concerning financial matters. And he'll just tell you point blank that God doesn't want you to have anything. Because he wants you to be poor like Jesus was. But yet, you see, Jesus was made poor that ye through his poverty might be made rich. He suffered the curse for you that you wouldn't have to suffer. Now here's the point I'm driving at. The individual that is that way, you, you would measure his faith by the word that was in him. He has great word in him, lots of word concerning salvation. He can probably quote all of the scriptures concerning salvation. So he's got great faith in that. Over here in healing, over here in, in uh, maybe the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he may not have any word in him. So when he says God has dealt to every man the measure of faith, he is talking about the word of God. God has given all of us the word of God. That is the measure of faith. This is all the faith there is, is in the word of God. They're just not anymore. And he's given it to us. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody's received it. That doesn't mean that every person that's born again has received it because they've only received parts of it. 
So to measure faith, you'd have to measure the amount of word that is in an individual concerning the individual promises. You have people that believe God for healing and can't believe God at all for finances. The reason is they don't have the knowledge. They haven't studied the word concerning finances. They don't know that it's God's will. They don't even know that Paul spent two whole chapters in, in 2 Corinthians talking about nothing in the world but money. Money. That's all he was talking about. And some of them will get mad at you if you talk about money in church. But Paul thought it was so important, he told them, you make up, take up the offering before I come. <laughs> and he spent two whole chapters there, the 8th and ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians, talking about money. Now this is what it means when we say that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. This is the measure of faith. It's in the Word of God, and he gave it to all men, but not all men have received it. Now that's why it takes faith to operate in the Word of God. Now, an individual is, does not spend any time in the Word, does not spend any time meditating the Word of God, you're going to end up in strife, you're going to open the door to the devil, and the devil's going to have a heyday in your house and in your family. The quicker you are to forgive, the quicker you are to repent when you do wrong, the easier it is for you to get healed and to operate in the things of God. I remember Brother Hagin telling a story, and, and uh, I thought it made such an impression on me. I've never forgotten it. He said that he was holding a camp meeting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and there was a lady that came from another state. She came, and she had made the decision. She, she was going to get her healing in that camp meeting. She said, now I'm going to go, and I'm going to sit under the Word, and be taught faith for, till Friday. Now on Friday, she says, I'm going to go in the healing line and be prayed for and I'm going to receive my healing. So this woman was uh, there th through the week till about Thursday. And uh, on Thursday, I believe it was, Brother Hagin taught on forgiveness. How that you must not be in strife with people. You've got to forgive people. If you don't forgive people, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. And then, of course, your heart would condemn you. And then your faith wouldn't work. So now, she's sitting there listening to this, and the, the enlightenment came from the Word of God. The entrance of the Word brought light to her. She saw it. She saw where her problem was, because, see, she had been for about 20 years. She hadn't even spoken to her brother. They had, they'd had a falling out 20 years before, and she'd never spoken to him since then. Well, at, at, at lunchtime, she said, I know what I'll do. She said, I, I'll just go across the street. She went to a public telephone, and she called her brother. She said, now, it's all my fault. She said, I shouldn't have acted that way. And, and he said, no, no, it wasn't all your fault. She said, I, I shouldn't have acted the way I did. So they got it all made up and over the phone and forgave each other. And she said, now, she said, I'll go tomorrow night and get in the healing line and get in the healing. But before the Friday night service ever took place, uh, she was totally healed. Nobody had prayed for her. She got in, she, she forgave her brother. She got out of strife, and then her faith would work, and the Word of God was in her. The faith was already there, but it wouldn't work because her heart condemned her. You see, she had a spiritual heart attack because she, her heart condemned her of that strife. So it's important that we learn to, to operate in the principle of the Word. Now let's, let's move on over into the 10th chapter here, and let's talk about unforgiveness, a thief. Because here is one of the primary areas where Satan enters in to individual lives and he can cause more havoc in your physical body and in your finances in every way through unforgiveness. It's a strong message that Jesus taught about it. And I want us to turn, turn there to uh, Matthew, the 18th chapter. And let's listen to what Jesus is saying now concerning forgiveness. Now, while, before, we, before we get into that, let, let me just quote you again. I know you remember it, but I want to quote it anyway, where Jesus was talking about in Mark 11, 24, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. He says, therefore, whatsoever things you desire, because of the faith principle that you can have what you say, when you pray, pray the things you desire. And then he says, when you stand praying, forgive. For if you forgive not your brother, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Now that's important when you pray, to forgive. 
Now somebody made the statement that that's probably the reason most people kneel and pray because the word said if you stand, you have to forgive. <laughs> you stand and pray. Well, certainly it means any position you take, you're to forgive. When you, stand, when you pray, you forgive people. Don't hold anything against them. Let it drop. Just let it slip. Now, listen to what Jesus says here in the 18th chapter. Let's begin with verse 20. Verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, boy, that's hard to swallow, isn't it? Seventy times seven. Now, in another gospel, it says that uh, Jesus said seven times, if he does it seven times in one day. So evidently, he's talking about in one day. This seventy times seven in one day. That's a lot of times to forgive a fellow. Now, in the 17th chapter of Luke, I think we've talked about this in one of the other sessions, but I want to bring it in here because this is the context of that teaching. When Jesus was talking about that forgiveness, forgive your brother seven times in a day if he repent and come to you, forgive him, then that's when the apostles said unto the Lord, Lord, increase our faith. See, they recognized immediately that we're going to have to do this by faith. Now, you know why you have to do things by faith sometimes? Because you don't want to do them. And, and because it looks like it's impossible to do. You see, you can do things by faith you can't do any other way. So the apostle said, Lord, if we're going to forgive a man that many times in one day, we're going to have to have more faith. Now let me show you what they're talking about and what Jesus was talking about. He said, if you have faith as a seed, then you would say to the sycamine tree. Now the sycamine tree to them might have been unforgiveness. See, the obstacle that was hindering them could have been unforgiveness. So he said, say to unforgiveness, be plucked up, be planted in the sea, and Jesus said, it would obey you. The unforgiveness would obey you. It would be gone. But now you know what most people say? They say, oh, unforgiveness, you grow every day. I'll never be able to forgive them. See, people said, have you ever said this? You just don't know what so-and-so did to me. I just can't forgive them. I know I ought to, but I just can't. Hey, man, you can't afford not to. Now, you know why you can't forgive them? It's because you said that for 29 years. If you will use your faith the way Jesus said, if you have faith as a seed, you say, you take your faith and say, thank God I can do all things through Christ, so I'm saying in the name of Jesus that I do forgive them. I may not want to forgive them, I may wish I didn't forgive them, but I've made a decision to do what the Word says, and I do forgive them. Now, somebody said, well, now, if you, you've got to forgive and forget. If you haven't forgotten, you haven't forgiven. Well, now, that doesn't hold water either. Because, you see, the harder you try to forget something, the more you remember it. You ever tried to forget something? <laughs> it just establishes it in your mind. Now, I know there's certain individuals that I was in business with, a, in a deal one time, business deal, that, uh, you know, I, I got, I got uh, in some problems there. It cost me a lot of money. Now, because the individual didn't do business like I did. Now, I've forgiven the man all right, but I don't want to forget it, not because I hold it against him, but because I don't want to get in business with him again. Now, what am I saying? No, I don't have any hostility. to. We're good friends today. But you see, I, if I forget that, I might go back and business with him. I don't want to do that. So you see, I cannot have any animosity in my heart. I can use my faith and forgive an individual. Now, if you make a decision to do that, you can stop unforgiveness. And Jesus tells you how to do that. Now, we're here in, in Matthew, the 18th chapter. Let's go on with this. Verse 22, Jesus said unto them, I say unto you, not until seven times, 
seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. Now listen to this closely, because here's where the hair-raising story comes, and Jesus is telling it himself. He's not just making up things to fill in the pages of the Bible. He's telling you how it is. It's not this way just because Jesus said it. But Jesus said this because this is the way it is. Now listen to it. When he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now, in one translation that I had, it said about $10 million. That's a pretty good sum. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife, his children, and all that they had in payment to be made. See, in those days, they'd just sell you as a slave to pay your bills. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. Now listen carefully to what he says here forgave him the debt. Now understand what he said. I have forgiven you the debt. The debt does not exist. Now I want you to catch this because we're going to come back to it. The debt is gone forever. He can't come back on him. He has forgiven him the debt of the ten million dollars. Now let's proceed. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now, there's one translation that said about $17. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when the fellow servant saw what was done, they were sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt. Notice the phrase. He said, I forgave you all your debt. Now remember, the debt's forgiven. Gone nullified, void. The, the handwriting is removed from the note. He doesn't owe it. It's forgiven. I forgave thee all the debt because thou desiredest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now, that sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? Twice he has said the debt is forgiven. I forgave you all the debt. Now, someone said, yes, but because he didn't forgive, he put the man in prison until he paid the $10 million. No, that is not what he is referring to. He does not owe the $10 million. The $10 million debt is already forgiven. What he owes him is forgiveness toward his brother like he received forgiveness from his Lord. And he didn't give it. So he was delivered him to the tormentor until he should pay all that was due. He was to forgive as he had been forgiven. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? The $10 million debt was already forgiven. He was not holding him in, in prison to pay the $10 million. What he owed was the same compassion toward his brother that the Lord had had compassion on him. And because of that he didn't have that compassion, because he would not forgive his brother, he was delivered to the tormentor. Now, do any of you have any idea who the tormentor is? <laughs> Well, let's read a little further. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Now, I told you your hair may stand up like mine. 
Now, if that won't get your attention, Mac, if you're walking in unforgiveness, you know what Jesus has... Pro How many of you know that Jesus was a prophet? He has prophesied here that you'll be turned over to the tormentor, turned over to the devil. Legal game for the devil. Open season on you. Now think about that for a minute. This is what Jesus said, So shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. He'll turn you over to the tormentor. Somebody said, well, why would God do that? He has no other choice. His word is out. He said, if you don't forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. So when you don't forgive, you can't get forgiven. Now see, if you, could, if you were perfect, you might get by with that. But because you're not perfect, the very fact that you won't forgive proves you're not perfect. So you're in a bad situation here. He said he'll turn you over to the tormentor. Now God has no other choice. You're open game to the devil. What you've done, you've got over in the devil's territory. And the devil, it, it walks in on the deal, and he'll torment you, and he'll cause you problems, and all your praying and all your crying will not deliver you until you have paid all that was due. Now, what is paid, uh, that, that what is due that must be paid is forgiveness. You must forgive even as you have been forgiven. Now, remember the prayer that Jesus prayed. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, what's he saying? If you don't forgive, the Father won't forgive. He can't. Now, someone said, yes, but you know, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, I know the Bible says that. Well, he says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. So someone said, well, if I confess my sin of unforgiveness, then God will have to forgive me. No. He doesn't have to forgive you. In fact, he can't forgive you. Did you notice he said he is faithful and just? Now, if he forgave you of unforgiveness while you're still in unforgiveness, he would not be just because he said you must forgive or the Heavenly Father won't forgive. So he would be unjust if he forgave you before you forgave the other individual. Now, you see what I'm talking about? Now, there are many Christians that are experiencing tragedy, calamity, hurt, harm, trouble. I mean, it seems like the devil just camps at their house because they have allowed unforgiveness to rule over them. And they are open game to the devil. I mean, God had no choice but to allow these things. See, you, you get into that situation where somebody said, well, why did God allow all that to happen to Job? Job walked in fear. He opened the door to the devil. God has no choice when his word is out. You get over in the devil's territory, then you've got problems. So when it says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins... He must be just in doing that. Now let me show you something about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is not like any other sin. It is a continuing thing. It continues right on as long as you're in unforgiveness. Now you know, you could get mad and sock a guy in the jaw, and then in 30 minutes you could repent and say, Lord, forgive me, I shouldn't have done that. Go apologize to the guy and hug his neck and tell him you're sorry and, and uh, all of that. And uh, God will forgive you for that. But now to go to God and say, now, Father, forgive me for being in unforgiveness against so-and-so. But I just can't forgive him. See, that's a different situation altogether because that, you're in a continuing act of sin. Unforgiveness is sin. And I'll tell you quite frankly, I believe it is a sin unto death. Now just stay with me, it'll turn out all right. 
It may not be the, the sin unto death that you're thinking about, but just follow me now. When we talk about a sin unto death, we're in the 11th chapter here now, we get into it. The sin unto death. When you talk about a sin unto death, we're talking about a sin that is a sin until the day you die. It may kill you all right. Now let me, let me read you something that John said uh, uh, about the sin unto death. And uh, I'm just going to throw this out to you. You can do what you want to with it. Let's read from 1 John, the 5th chapter, in verse 17 and 18. All unrighteousness is sin. There is a sin not unto death. Well, back up. We, we started too far down. Uh, verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, and he sh shall ask, he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that you shall pray for it. Now listen to what he said. There is a sin unto death. And he says, you can't, don't pray for it. Now don't misunderstand what he said. He didn't say don't pray for the man. He said don't pray for the sin. Any other sin that a man commits, you can pray for it. But don't pray for the man that is, is sin to sin unto death. Why? Because I'm convinced it is unforgiveness and you can't pray and get that sin off of an individual. Because it's a continuing act. Un, it, it'll be a sin until the day he dies unless he forgives. You can't get rid of it. It'll eat him alive. It'll cause him to go, you know, he can go and sit down and eat the biggest... Uh, T-bone steak in the world, but he can't enjoy it because he's in unforgiveness. He's eat up on the inside. He is going against the Word of God. Now, when I say it is a sin unto death, I'm talking about a sin that will stay with you until you die, and it'll probably carry you to an early grave if you don't get rid of it. Confessing that you have the sin will not get rid of it. You must rebuke the thing, talk to it, tell it to leave you, and proclaim that you forgive, you see. You've got to get delivered from it. Now, he didn't say not pray for the man. He said don't pray for the sin because the man's going to have to do something with the sin. Now, when you realize what he said, it, it helps you to understand how powerful this thing that Jesus is talking about over here is. He's turned over into the hands of the tormentor. Now, you see this, actually, you see this twice in Paul's ministry, that he turned certain individuals over to the devil, that their flesh might be destroyed, that they might, their spirit might be saved. Somebody said, well, did it work? Yeah, it worked. One of the men was a man there in Corinth that was uh, living with his, his own mother and cohabiting with his own mother. And, and uh, Paul said... Uh, deliver such a one to Satan. And then he wrote back and he said uh, to, to love the brother and to receive him that he had, re in other words, the indication was that he had repented. And it came, it came about, you see. Now, the thing that is in this is powerful and it's strong in that you can hold a sin against an individual. And I think this is where sometimes we've missed it some individual sinned against us. And we said, well, bless God, I'm not going to forgive them. Well, you can hold that condemnation on them. And you can keep them away from God by that. But if you'll forgive that individual, that go to them and say, I know it, you might have been wrong, but I forgive you. I know I went to an individual like that one time that had done some things that was very deceitful and, and it really hurt me, and I went to him, and I told the man. He had backslidden. I said, man, I, I forgive you. I don't hold anything against you. I'm praying for you. I got that condemnation off of him. The man got saved, got born, uh, fellowship restored with the Father, and died a saved man. But you see, you can hold that unforgiveness against an individual and cause them to go to hell. Because as long as they're condemned by that, they want to go away from God, not to him. Now let me show you another incident in the life of, of Jesus when, when he was on the cross. He prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
he prayed that condemnation off of them. And one of the guys turned to the Lord. I mean, he, he uh, repented right there on the cross. So you see, there's power in forgiveness, in forgiving people, and doing what the Word says to do. Hosea says, as we started out with this teaching in that Hosea 4, 6, God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, if you don't know any better, you can't do any better. But from the day on, you know better than to get in unforgiveness. Now, I can tell you how to get rid of unforgiveness, and that is begin to say, I forgive that person. I don't care what they did. I forgive them. I make a decision to do it. Now, somebody said, how in the world would that do it? Here's the way it works. It works by the principle of the God kind of faith. Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not in his heart, but believe what he's saying will come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. You say it long enough till faith comes. Faith comes. And then it causes the manifestation of that. It'll melt that unforgiveness from your heart. Pray in the Spirit. That'll help too. Now let me give you an illustration, another illustration. This is a, something that happened close to us. And uh, the lady that worked from my wife uh, a day or two a week, the doctors had diagnosed her as having tuberculosis. And they were going to send her to a sanatorium unless they could get her to take this certain type of medicine. Nowadays, they've got drugs and things that they can control it. and They don't have to send you, be away from your family. But you see, she was believing God for her healing. And she wanted to walk in faith. And she didn't want to take the medicine. But now the county, the county nurse and the, and the county health department said, you either have to take the drug or we're going to have to take you to a sanatorium. You'll have to be separated from your family. Well, that upset her, you know, and she, she got in strife over that. She said she wasn't going to take medicine. Bless God, she's going to believe God. Well, now, see, her heart was right. But yet, you see, she's causing strife in the family. Now, the family was all mad at her. Her husband was upset with her. The children were upset with her. Mother, why don't you go ahead and take the medicine? No, bless God, I'm believing I'm healed, see. Well, now, you see, medicine won't heal you, and it won't keep you from getting healed. So uh, my wife told me the situation, and, and we talked it over, and, and, and she went over there and talked to the lady and said, now, her name was Joyce, said, now, Joyce, the, the medicine won't heal you. But said, uh, if you'll take the medicine, believe God for your healing, confess your healing, put your faith in God, and uh, you can be able to stay with your family, and, and right now you're in strife, and your faith won't work when you're in strife. I mean, she most probably would have died an early death if she hadn't got out of strife. And, and my wife talked with her and reasoned with her and showed her in the Scriptures. And she finally said, well, you know, said, maybe you're right. I have just really been upset over this thing, and I've really been in strife about it. So she repented and, and got things right and went and told her husband and told the children, said, I'm wrong, forgive me now. I, I'm, gonna, I'm still trusting God for my healing, but I'm going to go ahead and take the medicine. You all want me to, and, and uh, I, medicine probably won't heal me, but it'll keep the symptoms down, and that way I can be with you all. So she got it all patched up, you see. Well, in about a two weeks while they... They had another x-ray, and the doctor took another one. And, and he said, now, now, we said, we don't understand this. He said, uh, we don't know what's happened. We know that the medicine we've given you uh, doesn't work that fast. But said, we, uh, uh, there's something wrong. He said, we can't even, uh, we, can't, we can't tell, uh, you know, that you, you, you've got anything. We're not even sure you've got tuberculosis now. And said, now we know the medicine hadn't done it. Well, now you see, here's a woman that in, in, in just a couple of weeks, she's almost got a total bill of health, clean bill of health, because she got out of strife and got over into faith and believe in God. Now she's got where her faith will work and her heart doesn't condemn her. So beware of the devil. He's out to kill you, destroy you any way he can. Stay away from strife. Where there's strife and confusion, there is every evil work. Well, I trust you've been blessed by this series, and I trust you've learned something that, that you'll escape all that the devil has planned for you and enter into all that God has planned for you.